most complete gateway on a city wall, not only here in York, but also in the United Kingdom. This is because it still retains its barbican, which is the tunnel-like structure on the outside of the gateway. We will see the barbican when we turn right. You will not see another original barbican attached to a city wall unless you go to Krakow in Poland. All the others have now gone. On the side of Warmgate Bar, we can see an Elizabethan gatekeeper's house, which stands on two stone pillars, one either side of the central archway. Maybe. We don't know where the pillars are from, but we do know they are of Roman origin. Reflection. The gateway would have had only one central arch. The others on the left and right are modern. The gate still has its original 15th century oak doors. The Barbican is an extra defensive structure on the outside of the gate. It is a double gateway formed by two walls, which stretch out into the road ahead for about 18 meters or 60 feet. The purpose of the Barbican was to slow down or trap any attackers in the tunnel between the inner oak doors and the outer doors, which were made of iron. The defending soldiers on the walls above could then attack those trapped below, firing arrows, throwing down rocks and boiling liquids. On our left is the Barbican Leisure Centre, which is named after the Barbican at nearby Warmgate Bar. This is where the UK Snooker Championship has been held many times, and it is also a music and entertainment venue. On our right is Fishergate Bar. This is the smallest of the five medieval gateways, first recorded in 1315. The red painted stone above the archway reveals the date of the current bar, which is 1487. Two years after that date, the gateway was attacked and damaged in the Yorkshire Peasants' Revolt against Henry VII. The rebels burned the gates of the bar after murdering the Earl of Northumberland. The gateway was bricked up soon after and wasn't reopened until 1834 to give better access to the cattle market. Looking ahead, we can see the top of York Minster. It is the tallest structure in York. What we want you to see is the Minster, not a tower block. Ahead, we can see the Travel Lodge, which is a modern building, but you can see how the architect has tried to get the building to fit in with old York. He's put a turret shape on it and covered the walls in magnesium limestone, the same stone the Minster and the city walls are made of. The idea is that eventually it will blend in with its older surroundings. Look to the left, and you can see in the distance a glass structure above the River Foss. This is York's flood barrier. A barrier is lowered from this structure to stop the River Ouse backing up the River Foss, and this stops the eastern side of the city from flooding. Unless it fails, as it did in such spectacular fashion on Boxing Day 2015. We move on to Skeldergate Bridge and cross the River Ouse, York's main river. Look to your right to see Ouse Bridge, the oldest of the bridges built in 1821, replacing various older bridges dating back to Viking times. Look to your right and you will see the city walls at Bale Hill, the grass mound with trees growing on it. Bale Hill was the site of William the Conqueror's second castle, dating to around 1068. Nothing remains of it, however, because it was only ever made of wood, and nobody wanted to pay for its upkeep. Eventually, it was found to be in such a sad state of repair, it was pulled down. On our left is an area known as Clement Thorpe, named after the Norman church and nunnery of St. Clement. Bishopthorpe Road ahead will take you to the village of Bishopthorpe, which is where you'll find Bishopthorpe Palace, home to the Archbishop of York. Also along Bishopthorpe Road, before the village of Bishopthorpe, you will find access to York Racecourse, on the area known as the Maze Mile. As we set off through the lights, Look left and keep looking left for a brief chance to see the smallest house in York. 
Watch out for the house at the top of the hill with a large black door with number 76 on it. Just after it, look in the gap and there is a door with the number 76A on it. This claims to be the smallest house in York. We are now in an area of Victorian and Edwardian York. With the arrival of the railways to York in the 1800s, the city grew rapidly. More houses were needed to accommodate the growing population, which had shot up from 17,000 in 1801 to a staggering 77,000 by 1881. These new suburbs were built outside the city walls with back-to-back -back terraces to house the people who had come to York to work on the railways and in the chocolate factories. Once the railways had arrived, York became much easier to get to and quickly became quite a tourist destination for the middle classes. No longer did you have to make the long and dangerous journey down south for entertainment by horse-drawn carriage, and so York soon became the leisure and pleasure capital of the north. Chocolate making took off in York mainly with the coming of the railways, although chocolate has been made in York since 1700. The two main chocolate makers in York were Terry's, who started making chocolate in 1767, and later Roundtree's, who had opened a grocer's shop in the centre of York in 1822. The Roundtree family were prominent Quakers, and unlike many other employers in those days, they were careful to look after their workers, providing their staff with a medical centre, canteen, library, and even a swimming pool on the factory site. Roundtrees also introduced pensions and paid holidays, something that was unheard of in Victorian times. They also gave public parks to the city, such as Roundtree Park and the Homestead Park in Clifton. In Campbellsham Road, we pass a modern housing estate known as the Chocolate Works, which gives a clue to what was in this area. Behind the buildings on the left, we can see a brief sight of what remains of the Terry's Chocolate Factory. Sadly, Terry's no longer makes chocolate here in York. The factory was closed down in 2005, and production was moved elsewhere. Its most famous product, the Chocolate Orange, is now made in Europe. If you look through the trees on the left at the clock tower, can you spot what's strange about it? It has no numbers on the clock face, just the letters spelling the words Terry York, a reminder of over 200 years of chocolate making in this city. Ahead of us is York Racecourse, the home of horse racing here in York. There has been horse racing in York since Roman times, and racing has taken place on this area of land, known as the Knavesmire, since 1730. The Knavesmire may get its name from a name, a common servant allowed to use this area for leisure and for grazing animals, and Mire, a boggy area of land, which it still is to this day. The Knavesmire wasn't just used for horse racing, but other entertainments also took place here. It was common to see bare knuckle boxing, bear baiting, and cockfights here. The most popular spectator sport, however, were the hangings which took place here from 1379 right up until 1801. People would come from far and wide to see villains hang at the Tyburn. The most notorious person to be hanged at the Tyburn was none other than Dick Turpin, the highway robber who was executed here on the 7th of April, 1739. Today, the Knavesmire holds around 15 days of horse racing a year, the highlight of which is the Ebor Festival that takes place in August. York Racecourse also had the honour of hosting Royal Ascot in 2005, whilst the Ascot course was being renovated. 
In 1982, when the late Pope John Paul II visited the United Kingdom, it was the first time a reigning Pope had visited this country. He came to the racecourse here in York and gave Mass to over 2,000